Welcome to the second developer diary of Wars of Arda. I am Master Bilbo, the lead developer, and in this, is, in this installment, I will be discussing the major changes in version 1.1, The Song of the Firstborn. Before we begin, I would like to credit the Silmarillion team, the Divide and Conquer team, the Botet team, the uh, Elder Scrolls Total War team, the Stainless Steel team, Broken Crescent team, and the rest of our own very... Uh, our very own Wars of Arda team and our own contributors. Your support has made this pod possible. I also want to state that in the course of this video, there will be references made to a campaign, but this is to be understood as campaign plans for the future. We do not yet have a campaign. I just want to make that clear to everyone watching at home. We do not yet have a campaign. So to start off, I thought I would describe the lore basis for each faction as briefly as I can, given the time setting and anything else that we may have added on that may be extra canonical. For this first part, I'll be using the Divide and Conquer campaign map, as we'll be using the same map, though we will be making a number of changes. Um, and I'll just be doing this to explain what's going on. There may be points that I use pre-recorded gameplay, just so that you have something to look at while I describe everything that, that needs to be conveyed. So with that, let's begin. Um, first, we have the Kingdom of Linden. Now, Linden, their story, like their other elven kin, begins in the first stage with the Wars of Beleriand. The War of Wrath left only a fragment of the Syrian west of the Blue Mountains. And that's this year. Um, so this is all the remains of Beleriand. Thus it was here that the remaining elves of Valerian congregated in the first days of the Second Age to form the Kingdom of Linden. Now it was the case that the various elven peoples differed from one another as much then as they do now, and so those that refused the rule of the last Noldoran king, Arani and Gilgalad, migrated east. First, the newly founded Kingdom of Eregion, that would be here. And then to Lothamorian. Um, this is the case for Amdir and Amra, and later Kelmor and Galadriel. Lothamorian, of course, is here. Or, alternatively, to Aaron Gallen. This was the case for Orifer and Thranduil. Aaron Gallen stands from here, as far south as the time over here. Now, Aregion, which was uh, here, was made up predominantly of a Noldor that followed Celebrimbor, and many who would have been a part of the House of Feanor. Celebrimbor, of course, being the grandson of Feanor. Though other Noldren houses would have made the journey as well. Many of those that moved further east to Lothlorien and the Greenwood would be almost exclusively made up of Sindar and Valerian, and find these realms already populated with the native Sylvan elves. I'll cover more of these respective stories when I get to describing Lothlorien and Aaron Gallen. But now back to Linden, which is, of course, here. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, here. Of those that remained in Linden, they were primarily a subset of Sindar, specifically the Falathrim, that were led by their lord Círdan. And there were those Noldor who sought to remain close to their high king Gilgalad. Now, early in the Second Age, during the War of the Elves and Sauron, a Regian was destroyed, and the House of Imladris was founded primarily by the survivors of the sacking of a Regian. They took Elrond as their lord. And we're talking a regain again, so that would be here. They took Elrond as their lord, and they would remain in, in Imladris, which of course is here. Long after Sauron had passed, I will speak more about the House of Imladris when we cover their monster. 
The kingdom of Linden would have suffered a similar fate, as at this point Sauron had dominion over almost the entirety of Middle-earth. He would never again reach such power. Gilgalad's realm uh, would be saved by the coming of Numenor, and together Sauron was pushed back out of Eriador and returned to Mordor. Millennia later in the Second Age, after the Akalabeth, Gilgalad would welcome the coming of Elendil, the leader of the faithful of Numenor, as he founded the realms of Arnor and Gondor. King Gilgalad built three great towers in the far west of Arnor. That's right here. Actually, I'm sorry, right here. The greatest of which is Elastirian, that would host one of the three Palantir of Arnor. The Palantir, of course, are the famous seed stones forged in elder days by Feanor and brought from Numenor. Eventually, Sauron was discovered to have not perished in the Akalabeth, but had indeed returned to Mordor and sacked Minas Thiel. So now we're talking down here. That being, of course, uh, Minas Athel. Which was the home of Isildur. Upon hearing Isildur's plea, the faithful of Numenor, that being both Arnor and Gondor, as well as the Gales of the Ladras of the Kingdom of Linden, first came together to form the Last Alliance. They would, of course, be joined by the two kingdoms, Arad Galon, the Moth Moran, as well as the Dwarves of Cal Doom. The final battles in the war included the disastrous Bragler or Dagorlad, which took place upon the fields of the Dagorlad here. As it so happens, this would be the first of several battles to take place in these plains. Um, the, uh, this one, of course, being prior to the Second World Wars of Arda, all the subsequent ones take place right around the setting. It was in this battle that the kings of both Lothlorien, King Abdir, and Aaron Gallon, King Orifer, were slain. The forces of these two kingdoms would play a much lesser part in the war of the last alliance thereafter. What followed was the siege of Baradur. Right there. It would last for seven years. Then Sauron himself came forth and did battle with the allies, but in those days, the might of the Eldar was still in King Gilgalad, and King Elendil the Tall was perhaps the most powerful of the Dúnedain to ever live. Through their joint efforts with Sauron slain, and the sealed work of the Ring of Power from Sauron's black hand is where guilt for the death of his brother and father. The story of the Ring of Power has been told numerous times and is not a focus in the Wars of Arda. We seek to tell the story of what happened in the millennia before the Ring was rediscovered. But going back to Linden, now, or in the Third Age. The case of Linden, what followed in the Third Age, was a mass exodus of the Noldor, likely due to the death of their king. Now, Gilgalad died without a direct heir, and so the title of High King of the Noldor should by right have passed to Elrond half Elrond, the Lord of the Ladras. Ladras being here. He refused, and so rule over the kingdom of Linden passed to the caretaker, Círdan, the lord of the Falathrin. Linden would raise their banners in war on occasions of dire need, but in the early Third Age, in particular against the witch realm of Angmar. With a, max, with a mass exodus of the Noldor to the Undying Lands, they never again reached the same splendors they did with Gilgalad as king. Linden, geographically, rules all the lands about the Gulf of Gloom, that being this here, which divides the Blue Mountains in twain. Blue Mountains being these and these. Three cities rule over the principal regions of the kingdom. Four Linden, in the north, ruled by Forlon. Mithlon, rules the center slash the central northern region of the kingdom and Harland rules over Harland in the south. 
The Linden campaign will be pretty straightforward. Principally, you need to defeat Agmar. There's nothing really beyond that. This understanding of the official canon of Linden will suffice to understand the setting of the Kingdom of Linden in the Wars of Arda. What has been added as extra canonical only really applies to the names of the various units that we will present in this video. It should be understood that given the high concentration of Falathrum left in Linden after the exodus of the Noldor, most of Linden's roster in Wars of Arda is reflected as variations of Falathrum. With that, we'll move over to the battle map. Okay, and welcome to the battle map. So, here I'm going to be just going through um, relatively quickly. I'll do a faction overview video at some point in the future where I'll really break down the stats of every of all the units, but we'll just kind of go through each um, tier of their roster for each for each of the factions presented in this video. So, first you have the Philathra Wave Breakers. Um, as part of the lower tier of Philathrum here. The Philathrum Wave Breakers have a decent shield value and a mace in melee. So they're your early tier armor piercing infantry. Um, and, and given that they have a shield, they will hold the line reasonably well. Uh, they're joined by the Philathrum Sea Guard, which are a reasonably powerful um, unit of pikes in their tier. Uh, note that the, that the Pikes in Linden's roster have a slightly different damage type to normal pikes, which makes them a little bit better in melee against infantry than you would normally expect. So, if put up against another unit of pikes of exactly the same stats otherwise, they would win. Um, so that's the Flathrum Sea Guard. You then have the Flathrum Shipwrights. Uh, they are a pretty good unit of javelins. I believe they use an axe in melee when they're done. Could be wrong about that. If they do use an axe in melee, that, that means they would be armor piercing both with their javelins and in melee thereafter. Uh, we then have Philathrum archers. Philathrum archers do not use the um, Philathrum fire arrows that will show you here in a little bit. Um, they just use a, a highly accurate with a uh, arrow with a bit of a damage buff, I suppose. Well, it's, it's not a buff, really. It just has a high base level of damage. In fact, let's just take a look at it here. This attack of 5. That could stand to actually blow up a tiny bit for their cost. Then we have the uh, Falathrum Sea Patrol. These are um, skirmish cavalry primarily, and then when they're done, they use a spear, I believe. So turn into spear cavalry. Expect these to be really good against other cavalry, and they kind of function as lance cavalry as well, so they'll be really good um, for cycle charges against infantry units. Kind of a really good unit of cavalry all around, so you definitely want to make use of them. Not many factions have such well-rounded cavalry. So that's the first tier of normal Philathra. You then move up to your heavier tier, heavy Philathra. You should actually pack on a bit of armor. Uh, the armor is 9 in these guys, which is about the level of Gondorian infantry. Um, they use the skill of the Philathra and the Noldor, um, in their armor smithing, but they're not, they're not on the level of full-on Noldor, so we're kind of halfway between them. Um, but you have a lot of the same sorts of units that you had in the previous tier. You have the heavy Philathrum shipwrights, which are armor-piercing javelins, and then they dual-wield axes and uh, blades of some kind in melee, so they're armor-piercing all the time. They do not have a shield like your other shipwrights do, though, so keep that in mind. And have heavy Philathrum archers, which are fantastic archers. Um, these actually do use the Philathrum fire arrows, and they're not 
they do have a flaming version, um, but they their base arrow looks like it's a light on fire as well. Um, the benefits of their arrow type, it's not armor piercing or body piercing or anything. What it does is it has it actually does have a a bonus to their to their damage. Uh, the way these things work in medieval two is there's kind of, um, whenever an archer fires an arrow or a projectile is fired at a target, you first have to hit the target. Um, and that's dependent on a projectile by projectile basis. And then it has to overcome the armor and the shield of the target, assuming it does that. Uh, and that depend what determines whether or not it does that. It's a bit of chance, but also um, the level, the the missile attack is kind of what's used to, to factor in whether or not it overcomes the target's armor and shield. Assuming it does that, then it does a certain amount of damage. Now, the damage modifier on the Falathrum fire arrows, as well as ranger arrows that we'll get to some point, uh, maybe maybe not in this developer diary, but in, in another one. Um, the the damage modifier is higher than most others for Falathrum fire arrows. Now, um, it also has an attribute that allows that gives it a chance of hitting multiple or of doing damage to multiple unit models, provided that it hits and does damage. So. That's kind of the thing behind their their arrows. They make for fantastic archers. And that's the heavy falafrim archers. You then have heavy falafrim sea guard, which are just a better version of pikes than your uh, falafrim sea guard. I don't think you get quite as many of them. I think you get like three falafrim sea guard and one or two heavy falafrim sea guard. Uh, but they are a fantastic pike unit. I do recommend you take them. Next have <clears throat> Heavy Flathrum Sea Wards. This is your first um, offering of uh, spear and shield units for holding the line and dealing with cavalry. Much more, well, a more mobile version of dealing with cavalry than uh, your pikes. Really solid unit of Spear and Shield. Personally, when I play as Linden, I like to take the more of the heavy Falathrum units than the basic ones, but I mean, if you need something cheap, the normal Falathrum units will do the job. This is what I would say, I would suggest it should be the backbone of your army, the heavy Falathrum sequence. And then you get your first real shock unit here. Um, that's the heavy Falathrum Axe Guard. You'll notice that there are a lot of axes and AP weapons in this roster among the Falatha. That's because Tolkien goes out of his way to mention that the Sindar like to use the axe. So, that's why we've done that. Uh, and then we have heavy Falathrum Wave Breakers, which are just a direct upgrade over their uh, lesser counterpart. Instead of using a mace, they use an axe, but functionally they're the same. Um, so that's your heavy Falathrum Units. And then kind of between your middle tier and your bodyguard tier, you have this really small elite tier where you get two units, the Axe Guard of Harland and the Footman of Forland. And these two units are AOR restricted to their respective cities. And they're meant to be thought of as kind of half Sindar, half Noldor. Uh, the Axe Guard of Harland um, are kind of a direct upgrade over the, um, what was the name of the unit? The Wave Breakers. Uh, they're slightly better than them. In fact, let's just go ahead and take a look uh, briefly at their stats. So, Wave Breakers have an attack of 10, the overall defense of 25. Number four long, they attack 12, overall defense 29. Uh, they, yeah, and they're 200 forms more expensive. 
Uh, they are in standard multiplayer games, slightly more restricted. You only get one or two of them uh, versus two to three of the Falafel. Or, I'm sorry, the Heavy Falafel. Uh, same deal with the Footman of Forlorn. Um, that's really all there is to say about them. Um, I would maybe only consider getting these if you're playing defensively in a siege given their cost they are kind of pricey um and they're really meant to be thought of as campaign focused units but you you could get some use out of them in a multiplayer game i would have thought uh, again particularly in a uh, siege where you are the defender and you've got a little bit more money to spend they might be useful for you there and then finally we have the bodyguard tier now we start with the Arvin e Eorendo, the Knights of Eorendo, or the Warriors of Eorendo, named in honor of Eorendo, the, the uh, father of Elrond, who convinced the Velar to intervene and uh, prosecute the War of Wrath. He essentially saved the world, so thought it would be fitting that they would have a unit named after him. This is a really good sword and board bodyguard unit. Um, attack of 16 is pretty average. Uh, the defensive skill of 16 is also relatively average, but an overall defense of 40 is very good. Um, it used to be the case that you could bring two of these. I think you can only bring one now. Um, and their cost has gone up because their def the rest of their defensive stats went up. They have really good armor, armor 14. These are pure-blooded Mordor. Uh, and they are the really good sword and board bodyguard, as I say. Not the best, but really good. The Wardens of Mithlond, um, this model's actually a work in progress. Um, they are a bodyguard archer, I believe. Yeah, they are two hit points. Uh, re they're really good in melee at the melee attack of 15. Uh, missile attack of 10, and they have a Noldor exclusive arrow type. Um, it's kind of like, it's not the Silverthorn arrow, but it looks vaguely like it. So the the uh, arrow trail is a little bit more pale blue. Um, and it, it is a high mass arrow, a high mass projectile, so it will disrupt and knock back that uh, like kind of ragdoll effect the the, um, the target. A really high missile attack as well, by the way. A really good defensive uh, skill, but very poor armor. Meant to be thought of as like a bodyguard unit of rangers. Um, now, that might change in future. We may end up increasing the armor, um, either by simply just, you know, recognizing the bit of armor they've got on now as being stronger than, than um, what the stats reflect, and we would just increase the armor stat, or by giving them a bit more of, like, the scale or plate for their own. Uh, they'll also likely gain a shield, like their counterparts in the Mladers that we'll see a little bit later have. Um, so they'll turn into a sword and board unit once they're done with their ammo. So they also hide anywhere. It's like a unit of rangers would. So that's kind of the Wardens of Mythwand. <clears throat> These are the Arvin Ecthalian. Ecthalian being the... Uh, being a champion of Gondolin in the First Age who... Uh, slayed a Balrog in the Fountains of Gondolin. Uh, he is a legendary um, figure among the Noldor, and so it, we found it fitting that their Swordmaster bodyguard would be named after him, in honor of him, I mean, uh, Ar the Arvani Ecthalian. They are one of the best Swordmasters in the mod, I would say they're pr they're easily in the top ten, probably in the top five. Um, 
Yeah, probably in the top five. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that. Uh, they have a lot of the similar similar level of armor to the Arvin the ERM deal, I believe. I want to say it's, oh, it's actually one higher. It's 15 instead of 14. Um, so they can tank quite a bit of damage. Uh, do watch out for cavalry charges. That sort of thing will decimate a unit of Swordmaster bodyguard like that. Speaking of cavalry, our final bodyguard are the Arvani Iranian. And these are the knights or warriors of Gilgalad. Gilgalad or Rhinan. They are a... Um, where is the, here we go. Uh, they are a really powerful unit of lance uh, cavalry. Really good charge bonus. Uh, solid attack. And a pretty reasonable... Uh, defensive skill set with a armor of 12. I could stand to maybe go up a good bit, like two or three points for their cost. Their defensive skills slightly less than average. That's where you need to watch out. They have a really good shield, though. And in prolonged melee, they continue to use their lance, I believe. Um, that may change in future so that they use a sword in prolonged melee, but they'll retain their bonus against uh, against cavalry. And of course they're effective against armor on the charge. So that's your lance uh, bodyguard cavalry unit. And then being a, a nation of elves, you get a ballista and a catapult. You're solidly average with your artillery. You don't uh, you're not really siege masters, um, nor are you deficient in performing a siege. So those are your two uh, artillery units. And that is Linden. So I will return now to the campaign map, and we will continue to discuss, I believe, in the address next. So I'll be right back. Okay, and so welcome back to the campaign map. Um... Again, we're using Divide and Conquer's campaign map, so I figured I would just go into Divide and Conquer for now. Um, <clears throat> so we'll be talking about Imladris next. And we'll start with the lore bases and work our way to um, the back to the battle map where I'll show you the roster. So in the case of Imladris, this splinter realm of Oregion would persist well into the Fourth Age. Having refused the title of High King of the Noldor, Elrond only goes forth to war when Imladris is itself besieged by Angmar. Uh, Angmar, of course, being up here. Uh, besieged by Angmar for seven years, and when Imladris joined forces with Linden and Gondor to put Angmar down once and for all. The only other notable point regarding Imladris that I think is worthwhile mentioning is that um, it is at Imladris where a reincarnate Glorfindel would spend most of his second life in Middle-earth. Indeed, it is from Imladris that he rides forth in pursuit of the Witch King, following the second battle of Forost, Forost being right here. Um, and only just arrives in time to save Prince Aarnor of Gondor. It is here that he makes his prophecy concerning the ultimate fate of the Witch King. Glorfindel, therefore, is represented in the standard multiplayer roster in Ladris, and he will, of course, be a character in the campaign. Uh, we'll see his, the unit, um, his company, uh, shortly when we get back to the battle map. Uh, turning to the future plans for campaign, your campaign objective as in Ladris is twofold. You can decide to either rebuild Eregion, by reclaiming Austin Thiel, which is uh, here, uh, and rebuilding the forges of the Gwaithi Myrdine, the people of Jewelsmiths. Or you can decide to go even further and claim the title of High King of the Noldor and annex Linden and become one mega, like, High Elves faction uh, to form a sort of Gondolin in exile. 
this kind of a reunited kingdom script of the high elves um, is kind of what we're describing if you want to think of it that way that's really all there is to him ladder so we'll go ahead and um, return to the battle map where I will show off the roster from Ladder, so I'll see you here in just a second. All right, welcome back to the battle map. So this is uh, in Ladrus, and you really have um, kind of the same tier system that Linden had, or a comparable one anyway. Um, so briefly, you have your entry tier, which are your household units. Then the Eldar and Way, and then your bodyguard and artillery. Now, as in Lantris, you are a faction that is predominantly Noldor. Like you probably have the highest concentration of Noldor um, among any of the factions in Middle Earth, and so we've tried to reflect that in their rosters, makeup, and in the uh, stats of the individual units themselves. So first, you have your household rangers. These are, um, well, rangers. Um, they are really good archers, and then they dual wield these axes in melee. Uh, some of them, I think, may use swords. Um, in either case, they are armor-piercing melee, uh, I believe. wouldn't actually say if I open it up, though. Yeah, so they, they are armor-piercing in melee. They have a really good missile attack of six. Um, and we probably need to add it... Um, give them the ability to hide anywhere and that they are rangers uh, and they'll have a ranger arrow as well so that's your entry and they're they do have a really good uh set of armor at nine so they're armored rangers and so you'll want to keep these around even in, as you progress in the campaign as you progress higher up and you also want to take these in game to standard multiplayer i would have thought then have your household guard. Uh, these are pikes, of course. And they, I believe, are armor piercing. Yes. So that's kind of their, it's kind of the reason you want to bring them um, and maybe hold on to them throughout your campaign whenever you get access to the Elder and Lace Sentinels, we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they have reasonably good armor, good skill. They don't have the slashing damage type like the um, pikes of Linden do, but the rest of their their stats make them, uh, I would say, more formidable than Linden's pikes are. Um, among the Elven factions, in Ladris is kind of the what would you say? They're kind of the closest to Gondor or Khazad Doom. They've got a lot of really heavy armor. They have a lot of spears and pikes. Um, and they're probably the most splendorous of the realms of elves at this point. So, anyhow, that's kind of a theme you'll see starting with the Household Guard. And you have the Household Swords. Um, oh, by the way, before I go any further, each of these units actually... A lot of Inlanders' units have armor upgrades. I've gone ahead and taken the maximum level of armor that each unit can take. Um, so the models would probably look differently than what you see here if they do, if you do not have their armor upgraded. But then you have your uh, your first offering, the sword and board. These are the household swords, and they're really good. Uh, that. Um, as you would expect for a faction of Moldor. An attack of 13 is really, really good. I mean, this is like Knights of the Silver Swan level of good. Uh, defense, um, 31. But you are paying a premium for these and Landers units, you know, between 800 and 1,000 as your lowest offering. Um, so that's your Household Swords, and I believe so the Household Riders. Now, they upgrade to this level of armor this might go away in future uh, maybe we'll see or we'll give this level of armor to the entire um, tier of the household units 
you have household riders. They're kind of the mounted version of the household rangers. Missile deck is slightly higher than the rangers uh, to make up for their um, shorter range. They're a little bit more expensive because they're on a horse. And decent melee attack for a horse archer. You don't want them in for long melee, though, necessarily. Um, and their defense is a little bit lacking because they don't have a shield. Um, but they're they're good for skirmishing, and they're good for um, harassing enemy infantry and just keeping the enemy busy overall. And so that's the household tier. Your middle tier are the Elder Inlay. These are your proper Noldor. Uh, they're trained for war. You have your Elder Inlay Lancers, second um, offering of cavalry. They are what they say they are. They are a unit of Lancers. They will devastate uh, infantry. They're not... I don't know if they have a bonus against cavalry. No, they don't. So you don't want them... Um, uh, I, they could probably handle themselves reasonably well, but they're less than ideally used in prolonged melee against other cavalry or against other infantry. You just want to get in, hit them really hard, and get out. Um, because they're lancers. That's how lancers work. Next we have the Elder and Way Archers. These are um, your Golden Boy Archers here. Um, they do not have the Philathrum fire arrows, so they used to. Um, they just have a really well above average arrow type. It, it, there's nothing else that's special to it. I think they just have a high missile attack. Yeah, eight. Um, really solid melee attack. I actually didn't realize their melee attack was that high. Um, I can live with that, though. Um... <clears throat> Because you are paying 900 for them, so I guess that melee attack can come down a little bit. But it's not the end of the world, really. Uh, so they can look after themselves in melee. Uh, but they have a really a really good um, missile attack. The thing they really hang their hat on is their armor 14. So they make for excellent skirmishing archers. So they can tank a lot of damage. And they'll put out a decent amount of damage as well. Their arrows are not armor-piercing or body-piercing, or even, uh, they don't have the area attribute or a, a damage buff, as, uh, so to speak. The thing about their arrows is that they're just highly accurate. Uh, pretty good range, good ammo supply, and decently damaging um, with their missile attack at 8. So, yeah, just, if, you took a, if you took an average unit of dedicated archer and just buff them up two or three levels. That's kind of what the Elder Inway archers are. Um, next we have the Elder Inway Spearin. This is maybe the most solid unit of... I guess some of the Dwarven factions may have something to say about that, but certainly among the Elves, maybe the most reliable non-bodyguard unit of spears out there. I mean, they're really, really dependable. I think they've got yeah, an attack of 12, which is crazy high for a unit of spears. You are paying a thousand for them, though, so keep that in mind. That's really all there is to say about them. Uh, the Elder Way, by the way, you only get two, three maybe, versus four or five of the household units. Um, so keep that in mind. The Elder and Way Sentinels are basically just a, they have a... I think they have a higher... Yeah, their attack is slightly higher, I want to say... Yeah, than the Household Guard. Slightly higher, but they don't have armor piercing. But their armor's a lot better, so keep that in mind. Um, very dependable unit of pikes. Up there with, like, the Fountain Guard and the um, First Legion pikes really solid unit of pikemen. So, use them when you can. And then finally, the Elder Inway Swordmasters. A lot of these Elder Inway units are arguably 
they're your elites or like middle tier. Um, but for a lot of other factions, they can go toe to toe with the bodyguard units of other factions. So um, the Elder and Waste Sword Masters have like bodyguard level stats. An attack of 23 is crazy for a mid to elite tier unit. Charge bonus of 15 is pretty average. And a total defense of 34 is really, really good. Um, especially with that above average 19 skill. The average skill for a sword mat, two handed sword master unit like this is somewhere in the 15 to 17 ballpark. And the fact that they get an armor level of 15. Um, the you know Noldren warriors is very good. This in Ladris is the closest you can get to um, playing Silmarillion Total War in Wars of Arda, um, or at least one of the Noldren factions in Silmarillion Total War, um, and that's by design. They're meant to be a, an echo of the Noldor of, Sil of the era of the Silmarillion. So, so that's your Elder Inlay. And then you have your bodyguards. Now your uh, quintessential bodyguard. I kind of put this model together to a certain extent. Are the Godhulim Yainar. And these, uh, I found that I got the shield kind of put together and textured up. And I'm really happy with it. Um, it is just an old model though, the base model. I did retexture it to a certain extent. But, um, but they're kind of like the old... Godhulim, I know. They're just an uh, archer with that same Noldren arrow that the Wardens of Mythlon had. Uh, I don't know if they're... they're not armor-piercing, though, but they are slightly better archers than the Wardens of Mythlon. Um, can they... They can hide anywhere, so they are just a direct... They are just objectively better than the Wardens of Mythlon are. That'll probably go away. They, they won't be... They won't have the ranger um, capabilities, but look at that defense of 45. Armor of 17. And it def this is almost dwarven levels of armor. Um, uh, these are the elite of the Noldor, so they should have access to that sort of thing. Uh, they turn into pretty good, kind of like the Knights of Enuminas that we'll see in a future video. I mean, they're, when they're in melee, they're really good sword and board. They're on, they're arguably under costed at only 1300. They probably should be more like 1600 florins. Really good unit of bodyguards here. And that's kind of your, that'll be kind of what you get as your bodyguard. Um, your, so for the campaign, the Godling Yainar will be Elrond's bodyguard. Um, and will probably be everyone's bodyguard that's not on a horse <laughs> um, until you reform the, the Regan. Um, and so when you do that, you'll unlock the Gwythi Myrdine. Uh, these are absolute demons on foot with hammers. Um, they... Let me find their... Here we go. So they have an armor of 17... But it actually went a little bit higher. Um, I want to say it can go. No, oh, no, that was a change. It used to be able to go to 18. We recently changed it, so they're stuck at 17 to kind of give them a little bit of room between them and the Dwarven elites. Um, but an attack of 28 and a charge bonus of 18 makes for an absolute freight train when they charge. Um, and a defensive skill of 18 is above average as well. Ar again, arguably under-costed at only 1,500. Um, they used to be three hit points, but we've made that change, so they're back down to two. Uh, the Gwythi Myrdine, can, they can take damage all day, as long as, even if it's armor-piercing. I mean, armor-piercing brings your armor value down uh, 50%. So you're still at an armor of Gondor infantry when your armor is cut down in half. So, and they don't have a shield and their total defense is still 35. Make use of these whenever you can. 
multiplayer campaign doesn't matter. Uh, furthermore, you have the Gwaithi Arthan. These guys, um, but, uh, their unit size is what makes them so lethal. Um, so an attack of 11 is really solid for a spear unit. Uh, it's slightly less than the Elder and Way Spearmen, but the thing they hang their hat on is their defense. And actually, 14 is less than I expected. Um, that was an oversight on my part. It, they'll be able to get an armor of like 16 at least. Um, defensive skill 13 for a Spearman unit is really good, and their shield of 11. But look at that shield. Just really solid. Again, the, the thing that makes them a lethal bodyguard unit to go against is their unit size of 83. So keep so look out for that when you, if you're playing against them or if you're playing as them. Um, recruitment cost of 1,200 is slightly on the cheaper side, but I think still reasonable for them. So do take them whenever you can. Uh, like the Gwaithi Mirdan, they'll be a unit you unlock when you rebuild a Regian. So, um, I'm going to save the last bodyguard, or that bodyguard unit in the middle for the last here. Uh, you have two, so you're kind of the cavalry faction among the elves. You have um, the Gwythi Rock Door, which are kind of the equivalent. Uh, um, you're equivalent to the Arvini Arainian that Linda had. Uh, they are a lance unit of cavalry, and they are monsters um, they're, uh, they're like demon lancers basically total defense of 40 is crazy for a unit of cavalry they can get up to 18 I think it's because they start at 17 and can go up um, yeah that might drop in future to, the, to their max being 17 just for consistency's sake but 1550 for cost is, I think, pretty reasonable. I mean, that you get, you're getting what you're paying for. They are monsters of war, and kind of the more we'll fix that officer at some point. Um, I keep forgetting to do that, but kind of your, um, so if they're your lancers. These are your melee knights in the Gwaithi Um They wield these little hammers. Uh, they're kind of designed to to reflect the relationship that the elves of Aragian had with the dwarves of Khazad-dûm. Um, and they will murder other cavalry, and really anything. I mean, these, their charge bonus is lackluster, as you would expect for melee cavalry, but an attack of 20 is crazy. They are, I mean, maybe the Haven Knights have something to say about them, but I can't think of many other units of cavalry that can go toe to toe with them and prolong the melee. Um, so bring them whenever you can. All the the units that start with Gwyth are units you unlock uh, when you unlock a regiment for the campaign. By the way, so just keep that in mind. And then this unit, these <laughs> gods of war. The Thalion and Malice, the um, Warriors of the Golden Flower. Okay, so these guys are what we're calling Eternal Legend units. And Units of Eternal Legend are a new concept we came up with for Wars of Arda. They are, um, if you have your bodyguard units, they really should be like back here, <laughs> if anything. Um, they have a they have an armor of 16 defensive skill 25 shield of 10 three hit points total defense of 51 um their armor piercing their attack of 17 and all of these units are going to cost you at least 2000 florins so this is bar none the best sword and board unit in the mod at this point, and likely to continue to be so. Unless if we come up with another Sword and Board Eternal Legend unit, they will be the best.
and the Thalian and Malus are meant to be the company of elves that um, uh, this didn't happen in canon, of course. Glorfindel returned on his own. But um, for the sake of Wars of Arda, we decided to give them a unit that um, that returned from Amon, from Valinor, with Glorfindel. And that's what the Thalian and Malus are. Kind of like the, the reincarnate of Gondolin. Um, and so... We actually got this model, by the way, from Siln. We've gotten a lot of the models so far from Siln. Um, and this was put together, I believe, by Castle, who's doing his overhaul mod for uh, Divide and Conquer. It's also part of the Divide and Conquer team. But I gave them this cloak and textured it. So that's my contribution. Thalion and Malus. Uh, all the Eternal Legend units um, will have a smaller unit size compared to the rest of the bodyguards, like 65 and 43. They will never be on horseback, they will always be on foot, and they will never have any kind of ranged attack. They'll be melee fighters on foot. So, um, saying that, they're not... I don't think they're good. Yeah, they're not good uh, when they get charged by cavalry. So keep them away from the cab track. And I think the best environment for these Eternal Legend units is probably in a siege. Uh, so, or a cityscape battle, that sort of thing. So, keep that in mind. And then, finally, as in Landers, you have a catapult and a ballista. Um, just like Linden did. Uh, oh, one final thing to say about the Thalion and Malice. They will be available to other factions in the campaign, but um, standard multiplayer, they will be available to Landers only. Uh, I think that's everything I have to say for Enlatris, so we will return to the campaign map. See you in just a second. Alright, welcome back to the campaign map. So now we'll be moving on to Lothlorien. Uh, and Lothlorien is one of the more complicated of the major Elven factions, as it kind of consists of several sub-factions, which we have tried to represent in Wars of Arda. I will keep things as brief as I may. Um... But we'll go ahead and go forward here. So as I said earlier, many of the Sindar, except the, for the Thalathrim, refused the rule of Gilgalad, and so migrated east of, of the Misty Mountains into the pre-existing Sylvan Elven realms of Erangallon, which was up here, and Lothlorien, which is of course here. In the case of Lothlorien, this would be ruled by King Amdir, who would perish in the Battle of Daggerlad in the War of the Last Alliance. In the present setting of 1900 of the Third Age, it is still ruled by his son, King Amroth. Now Amdir, father of Amroth, brought with him a host of Sindar from the west, most of which make up the nobility of Lothlorien, as we will see in their roster overview shortly. One of these Sindar is the Lord Celeborn of Doriath and Beleriand. But with Celeborn, there came a small company of Noldor, and other Noldor who would come to Lothlorien in times thereafter. Uh, and these Noldor followed uh, Celeborn, but more so followed his Noldoran wife, Galadriel, who was the daughter of Fenarfin and sister to Fenrod Felagund, who died in the First Age. Celeborn and Galadriel are, of course, esteemed members of King Amroth's court, and both of these characters are represented in the roster, in the roster of Lothlorien, as we'll see shortly. Now, the native Sylvan Elves had a mixed reaction to the usurping of their realm by these foreign Sindar from the west. In particular, there would be a faction of Sylvan Elves, led by Nimrodel, who was the love interest of King Amroth, who eventually had enough of the calamity befalling Lothlorien, and, blaming the Sindar, would segregate themselves from the rest of their realm. These Sylvan would become known as the Galathrim, the Tree Folk. Now, our interpretation of the Galathrim is such that they would have been influenced heavily by the ruling Sindar, in part because of the, of the love interest between Nimrodel and Amroth, but also because the Sindar had ruled over Lothlorien for millennia before they finally coalesced into an actual sub-faction within Lothlorien. 
They still recognize Amroth as king, at least for Nimmerdale's sake. And there is, for our purposes, no further role that they play into the narrative than simply existing as a portion of Lothlorien's roster. In the future, uh, the Lothlorien campaign, we may decide to do another sort of reunited kingdom script between Lothlorien and Aaron Gallen to form a sort of Doriath in exile. Otherwise, your objective will be quite generic, I'm afraid. Um, and as of yet, nothing specifically defined, though it will probably have something to do with a disruption of Dolgaldor. And that's really it. Um, all I have to say about Lothlorien generally and in the sense of their campaign. So we'll now turn to the battle map. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the battle map, this time with Lothlorien. Um, <clears throat> so, I'll start off by saying that Lothlorien, uh, as well as Aaron Gallon, that we'll see shortly, share an entry tier in common. These are just generic Sylvan units. Um, the one difference is that the uh, is that Lothlorien being a more archer-focused faction, have Sylvan Archers versus Sylvan Slingers, or Skirmishers. I don't remember the name exactly. We'll see here in a few minutes with uh, Aaron Gallon. Um, Aaron Gallon's more of a uh, skirmish faction than an archer faction. So, so that's the big difference between them. Um, and so, with that one exception, I'm only going to cover the Sylvan tier of the roster once. And they'll be here with Lothlorien. So you start with, you have Sylvan Blades, dual wielding swordsmen. They're really highly skilled and have a pretty good um, melee attack of 11. Um, <clears throat> but given that they're Syl uh, Sylvan, their armor is not going to be especially great. It is kind of this wooden scale. Um, but So it's not horrible. Uh, but it's not gonna. You're not gonna be able to upgrade it really beyond that. <clears throat> they they have a very um, high defensive skill, much higher than average, um, especially for an entry tier. So that's kind of what they hang their hat on. Uh, being elves, and this is true of all elves, they have a bit of a speed bonus as well, um, but they sacrifice a little bit of mass. So keep that in mind. Um, I think they are the largest of the Sylvan units to kind of offset for the fact that they don't have a shield and, or AP. They just rely on a really good skill. So they have a slightly larger unit size than the other Sylvan units. But other than that, there's nothing really to say about them. I don't think they hide. They're just in wood, so... Yeah, that's the Sylvan Blades. You then have Sylvan Spears, which are exactly as they sound like. Pretty much what has written on the box. Really good attack for a spear unit at nine. Um, <clears throat> but again, they're lacking in armor. They kind of make up for it a little bit more with the shield and their melee skill. Um, slightly smaller unit size than the blades because they have that shield, but that's again the Sylvan spears. The Sylvan, I believe they're just axes, yeah. Um, Kind of think of them as sword and board, but AP because they've got the axe. Um, let me find the where here. Uh, yeah, so their axes it uh, gives them an, an attack of eight. It is of course armor piercing. They have a defense of twenty five with a reasonably good melee skill. I mean, this is the first shielded Sylvan unit that we've seen yet. So they will have less of a melee skill uh, than the blades did but more than the spears, because they're wielding a more, um, a less unwieldy melee weapon. <clears throat> Shield of Six is also pretty good. All a really solid unit. Um, because they have AP, their unit size is slightly smaller, and 800 might actually be a touch too high for a cost. I mean, they do get an attack of 8, so that might come down to like 750, say. Yeah. But um, I think they're definitely worth taking, though, as Lothlorien. 
Especially because, as you'll see, they don't have a whole lot in the way of, of um, shock inventory. So getting that little bit of AP where you can is, is very useful. Um, speaking of AP, the Sylvan Archers, they don't have it from piercing, of course. I think they do have poison arrows, if I'm not mistaken. Um, otherwise, it's just a really accurate and... Um, High arrow with a high missile attack. Uh, they don't hide anywhere. That might be something we change in the future to make them kind of like a ranger unit. Um, but here again, armor of six, um, as has been the case. Uh, defense of 12 is reasonable. Um, not quite as high as the axes, but they do dual wield axes here, so. They're not meant to be dedicated melees, so that's why they don't have a higher defensive skill. And they've got about the same unit size as the axes, so and you can bring... A, I want to say you can bring three or four of them, I, I think. Um, and again, I'm fairly certain their arrows are uh, poisoned, so you'll have that uh, going for you. Do a lot of morale damage. And they're just a reasonably solid unit of archers. All around. And then finally you have your Sylvan Mounted Company. Now these guys, um, I'm not sure if we've made the change for them yet, but they're really meant to just be anti-cavalry cavalry. Uh, they get, they'll get a spear bonus. I, I don't know if they're still... No, okay, it, I do think we've made that change. So they used to be kind of a combination of anti-cav uh, riders as well as lancers, and we thought that I felt that to be a little bit too strong, especially for their low cost of 650. So they were they have their armor piercing removed. They're not actually going to be. They still have a reasonably high charge bonus and a decent attack for what they are. So you can do some decent cycle charging with them, but they are not meant to be lancers. Um, they can. They're sort of. Lancers and a pinch, but you really want to use that, as I say, to uh, assassinate other units of cavalry. So those are your Sylvan Mounted Company. And as I said, that's the Sylvan roster. It's um, the same. It's identical, except for um, instead of archers, you get slingers for Aaron Gallon. So I will only cover the Sylvan slingers when we get to uh, Aaron Gallon. Plus your entry tier. Uh, you kind of have an elite tier, uh, or well, I guess a middle tier of elite Sylvan elves that have learned some of the ways of the Sindar. Um, those are the Galathra here. They've kind of cherry picked the best of what they felt the Sindar had to offer and then proceeded to isolate themselves. And so, uh, yeah, we'll start on this end, that's fine. Uh, we have Galathrim Bows. <clears throat> they, uh, I believe, also have um, Poison Arrows. Melee attack of 8 with these axes that are armor-piercing. Uh, missile attack of 8. Again, I believe it's... I believe it's Poison. Um, that's kind of a Sylvan thing, instead of Poison Arrows. Armor of 9... Um, which is considerably better than the R6 that we, um, that the, sil the rest of their Sylvan counterparts had. Uh, and a defensive skill of 10, which is reasonably good for a um, dedicated archer unit. Could stand to be a touch higher, given that the Sylvan archers, where they went, had a defensive skill of 10, or I'm sorry, of 12. Um, so it could stand to go a little bit higher. Uh, we're already here. Um, but overall, I think they're still well worth taking. And I think you get, um, for the, the entire Galathrim roster, save one unit, I think you get two or three versus four or five of the normal silver units before the red limit, so keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> Next we have the Sylvan, or I'm sorry, the Galathrim Swordmasters, and this is kind of your first and only shock unit that's not a bodyguard. Um, so as I say, you're kind of lacking in that department. 
And of course, being sword masters, they're not armor piercing. Um, let's find them here. And they're honestly fairly average for a mid level sword master like this. An attack of 16 is reasonably good. Charge of 15 is average. Total defense of 26 is pretty good, actually, probably slightly above average. Armor of 9. You would say that's average. Defensive skill of 16 is kind of what they hang their hat on. Uh, shield of 1. I don't know if... Um... Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, we've given some of the um, these elite Sylvan units a tiny shield value to uh, reflect their their uh, martial prowess. So, you know, they, they have excellent reflexes. They can, like, dodge the occasional arrow and whatnot, but it's all, it's the tiniest shield value of one. Um, so, and it's really kind of more of a gimmick, like a little party trick that they've got. It's not anything that's going to, that should win you a battle. Um, but I thought it was just a nice touch. 950 florins for the Sword Masters. I think that's a reasonable price, uh, especially when you're getting two of them. It might be uh, it might be a little, little over costed, but they're they're reasonably good sword masters, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't balk at uh, that price if I were a player. Uh, you have the Galathrum Axemen next. These are a sword and or I'm sorry, a, a shield and axe unit, like their uh, Sylvan counterparts. Um, an attack of ten. Its armor piercing is always welcome. Uh, in my book. Kind of a lackluster charge bonus that you, as you would expect for a unit that's uh, shield wielding. Um, <clears throat> armor of 9 again is consistent across the Galathrum roster. With a defensive seal of 12, it's a little bit more than the uh, archers, or I'm sorry, the Galathrum bows we saw earlier. Again, I think their melee skill is going to come up to this 12. Shield of 8 is really solid, though. Um, it's a couple points better than the normal Sylvan, and it certainly, I think, is reflective of their more elite Sylvan status. Um, again, much-needed melee AP for your roster. You've got it kind of sprinkled about your, um, your archers as well, which is handy, but... AP with a shield is always nice to have. So this, those are your Galathrum Axemen. Uh, you have your Galathrum Spearmen. So pretty much as is set on the, as is uh, written on the box, they're just a solid unit of spears. An attack of nine, much like the other Sylvan spears before them, they had an attack of nine, or was it eight? I, no, it wasn't nine. Um, In fact, are we the same stats overall? No, okay. So, yeah, we, our defensive stats are a little bit better for the left and Spearman. And we are a little bit... Yeah, but you pay another 100 florins to hold the line a little bit longer. They, of course, have a bonus against Cavalry and can make shield roll. Pretty good unit of Spears. Not the best, not the worst. 800 florins for the privilege. I'd say you can take a couple of them and still be cost-efficient with your uh, multiplayer roster, and you definitely want them in campaign. They'll hold the line for you. And then this unit are Nimmerdale's finest, Galathrum Elders. This is your um, your only dedicated pike unit as Lothlorien. And let me find them here. They are here. Um, an attack of 9 as a pike is really good. Really, really good. Um, <clears throat> armor of 9, just like all the other Galathrum units, that might actually go up to 10 in future, just to reflect that they're the elite of the Galathrum. Uh, they get a little shield value, despite not having a shield, as we discussed earlier. 950 florins, I think it's a solid price for them. They've always performed really well on the games that I've, in the multiplayer games I've, um, had with, or had as and against them. But they're not the elite pikes of Imladris, Gondor, or Cause of Doom. Um, 
they're kind of somewhere around the Epiphil Lathom Sea Guard, I would I would think. Um, maybe a little bit better. But um, yeah, good unit of pikes for you. And as I say, the only dedicated unit of pikes you get. You only get one of these though. So or maybe you get two. In either case, you don't get many of them, so keep them safe <laughs> until you need them. Um, don't let them get shot at too much. So that's the Galathra. Uh, we'll move on to your elites. Now your elites are kind of a guard of Karis Gallup, the, uh, <clears throat> the capital city of Lothlorien. And so you have, um, being Lothlorien, you naturally get a unit of force archers, as you should. So you have the Karis Gallup and Patrol. Uh, all these units here are, I'm pretty sure, okay, yeah. All these, all the units in this tier are just a single hit point. So they're not bodyguards, but they are very elite. Uh, you get a um, you get silver thorn arrows with these guys. I'm pretty sure, uh, and I think they have yeah, they're pretty good in melee as well. The little swords they pulled out. Um, defensive skill of 17. You do have to pay um, for the privilege of them though. Um, and I, if, I, if memory serves, they have a reasonably good um, ammo supply and range for a horse archer. So these are one of the better horse archers in the, in the mod. Um, yeah, that's really all there is to say about them. Uh, well, the Silverthorn arrows, I guess I'll mention now, are kind of like the um, the Noldoran arrows, uh, the elite Noldoran arrows that... Um, uh, they, they're a high mass, so they kind of ragdoll, uh, throw around, and knock back the uh, intended target unit models. I'm fairly certain they're not armor-piercing or anything like that yet. They could be shield-piercing, though, where they reduce the shield by 50%. I, I'll have to look into that for sure. But um, anyhow, really good unit of force archers. Uh, you have the dismounted version of them, the Guard of Karis Galagon. Um, and... Pretty much the same. They're all, in fact, I think they're virtually identical. I gotta find them here. It's these guys. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're virtually identical, except they're slightly better in melee. And, um, let's see. Yeah, they're slightly better in melee. And they're not on a horse. That's really all there is to it. Uh, they have about double the units, or actually, I'm sorry, triple the unit size. Um, for balance purposes, we keep cavalry units a bit smaller, unless if you're a cav-focused faction. Uh, and they'll do, they pull out a two-handed sword in melee, I believe. Yeah, and they're actually very good sword masters when they're done. Uh, they had a an attack of 19, which is very high. Um, defensive skill of 19, so this is, these are really heavy hitters. Do take these and gain some multiplayer. In fact, I would say start when you're making your multiplayer roster with this tier. Get all the units that you can in this tier and then move down to these because these are just really, really good. Uh, you next have Defenders of Karis Galatha. I love these uh, golden leaf shields they've got. Uh, an attack of only 9 is a little lackluster for their tier. I think they could stand to be a little bit better. Maybe 10 or 11. Uh, and then get them back up to 1,000 florins again. Uh, just because I like consistency. But a shield of 7. Um, actually, that's... That might be a typo. Yeah, that should be a shield of 9. I, I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> that was intended to be just slightly higher than the Galathrim. Uh, but they still have a defensive skill of 15, which is unreal for a spear unit. So um, so expect their stats to change a little bit. They'll probably be more in line with the rest of their the units in this tier. But uh, again, uh, an elite spear unit you can take one or two of before the Red Limit. Do take them. Any of you Rangers of Karen and Amroth, these guys at the moment... Um, this is your only unit of rangers. They, I don't remember the melee weapon they use. I think it's a, 
they do wield swords? No, I think they get the two-handed sword that they use. Um, it's either a, it's either a great sword or a or they dual wield swords. One of the two. In either case, they use um, these are meant to be Sindar rather than Sylvan, and so they use uh, silver thorn arrows as well. Um, <clears throat> but they hide anywhere. They kind of sacrifice the missile attack a little bit um, for the ability to hide anywhere, and they have a decent melee attack. They're not they're not going to be as good as the um, Karaskal and Patrol. They're just meant to be kind of well a ranger unit. They're kind of the thing you have in your back pocket that you can ambush your opponent with uh, later in the game. But they do come with silver thorn arrows, which makes them a very deadly unit of rangers. So keep that in mind. Uh, and for only 900 forms, I would say they're well worth it. Um, and that's your, those are your elites. Um, and then we have the bodyguard and the monsters. Now your general's bodyguard, you're like, so for example, the bodyguard of King Amroth will be the courtiers of Karis Galifron. These are the elite Sindar. They have... Uh, they use a two-handed sword in melee. The melee attack at 20, and defensive skill of 22, which is well above average. Um, their elite skill is reflected with a slightly um, higher shield value that that's intended to perform the same function in the lower tiers. Uh, we bump that up to three. Still not enough to win you a battle, but it might be enough to make a difference between a uh, sword fight between bodyguards. And there are also archers. Um, they use a split shot uh, fire arrow that is um, effective against armor. It's, a, it's AP. They are maybe the pinnacle of elven archers. Um, don't want to... Uh, you don't want them to be firing into your if you're against them, you don't want them to be firing, say, into, like, your Gondor infantry. They will rip them to pieces. Um, but likewise, their armor's only nine, so if they get hit, uh, they can only skirmish so much um, before they start to drop quite a bit. Average unit size for a bodyguard. I think they're well worth their cost, though. 1,200 might actually be a little bit under-costed, considering the damage they can do. So... That's the courtiers of Karis Galifa. Uh, we have the Girdle Guard of Galadriel. Now these are Noldor, pure blooded Noldor that followed Galadriel to uh, from Aragorn to um, Lothlorien, and have been her personal bodyguard since then. This is the only unit of Noldor in Lothlorien's roster and are meant to represent the Noldor of Lothlorien. They use that same um, Noldor arrow that um, the Wardens of Mythlond and the um, Godwin Yainar use. Um, let's see. Here. Here we go. So they have a missile attack of 9, which is pretty good. But um, not amazing. It's a high mass arrow, so it's a unit disruptor. Um, melee attack of nine, and you can't see it now because they're not. I had some difficulty modeling it. Um, <clears throat> but they pull out a pike. So this is your second unit of pikes you get. Um, and so really, they're a defensive, more defensive focused unit. So, um, let's keep that in mind. I think that for the cost, 1500 actually is maybe a little bit steep, but for a pike unit that has a defensive skill of 11 and a melee attack of 9, that's also a, a uh, disruptive archer, 1500 is probably not too far off the mark. Um, I think they're... I think you could get away. You could definitely get away with using them in a siege, 
Um, and in a field battle, even, I mean, they're going to be awkward to deal with. You can't comfortably charge them with cavalry because they'll just pull out a pike and massacre that unit you know, of cab. So, yeah, I think they're they're definitely a unit well worth taking. And this is your only unit of shock AP infantry in your entire roster, and that's the Kindred of Kelleborn. They're very highly armored. Let's find them here. Yeah, an attack of 25, charge bonus of 15, total defense of 28, with an armor of 12. Doesn't get better for you. Um, these are like the most elite of Sindar. Defensive skill of 16, that's on the higher side of average. 1500 florins, so you're kind of paying for the privilege of being able to take a shock infantry unit. Um, that's well armored, so I think, I would say they're probably worth it. Uh, they also get a bonus fighting cavalry, so they're, this axe of theirs is actually almost more of a pole arm. Um, I would say that um, they're probably worth taking in multiplayer, though. Definitely. And then, uh, being one of the kind of the wood elven factions, um, you have the Huorns. These are not Ents, kind of somewhere between just a, you know, tree like that over there, halfway between that and an Ent. Um, and they're very melee focused, only two hit points, so they're kind of lackluster in that regard. They have an attack of six, they're kind of slow moving. You can think of them as um, kind of like the uh, Barrow Whites and Reforged, they kind of move slowly. Um, have a good defensive skill. They've got high armor, fifteen. Kind of a low, <clears throat> kind of a low burning armor piercing attack. Uh, they come in a unit size of a hundred, which is higher than the other um, tree monster <laughs> units that we'll see in the other rosters here in this video. Um, but they're exclusive to Lothlorien in. Standard multiplayer, and they're primarily for Lothlorien in the campaign, but of course you'll be able to take them with other factions as well. Um, this model came from Botet, so I gotta thank them for that. That's really all there is to say about them. And then finally, as Lothlorien being an elf, you get Catapult and Ballista. And that is Lothlorien's battle map um, in their roster, so I will rejoin you all for Aaron Gallen on the campaign map. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the uh, campaign map. So we're going, we're proceeding with Aaron Gallen here. And in the case of Aaron Gallen, much is the same as Lothlorien. Uh, Orifer lost a host of Sindar, or let, I'm sorry, Orifer led a host of Sindar into Aaron Gallen, and the native Sylvan made him their king. The Sylvan Elves and Aaron Gallon apparently hold little to no resentment towards the arrival of the Sindar, as there is no splinter faction that would be comparable to the Galathrin. King Orifer, like King Amdir, dies in the same um, Bragor Daggerlad, which of course takes place down in here, and his son Thranduil becomes king. Unlike Lothlorien, however, there are no known Noldor that reside in Aaron Gallon, and the only host of Sindar that arrive there are those that come with Orifer. We assume, therefore, that Aaron Gallen has the higher concentration of Sylvan Elves, but due to limitations in the number of units in any given mod, we could not represent this by simply expanding their Sylvan roster relative to Lothlorien. But we'll talk about this more in a moment. We did assume that there would be a bit more mixing between the two subpopulations of Aaron Gallen, and so the lines between Sindor and Sylvan would be blurred. This means that there is a tier of Aaron Gallen's roster that is half Sindar, which are the warrior class of Aaron Gallen. This too we will discuss momentarily. Um, as said before, in a future Aaron Gallen campaign, there may be a sort of reunited kingdom where the player annexes Lothlorien to form a sort of Doriath in exile. Your objective as Aaron Gallen will be to destroy Dorogor. And that's really all there is to say about their campaign and their, their background. So we will return to the battle map. Be right back. And welcome back to the battle map, this time with Aaron Gallen. Um, so as I said in the 
with Lothlorien. I'm not going to cover the too much of the Sylvan roster except for the Sylvan uh, Slingers here. Um, though I would like to just point out that if you if you rewind and go back and watch the Lothlorien battle map, you'll note the difference in color scheme. Uh, we're able to change textures on the same model for the same unit, but not that we're not. So for any one given unit that's shared between two factions, we can change the textures, not the model. And so that's what we've done here. Um, there's more of a green, uh, the green male here, and, or a scale, I'm sorry, green uh, gauntlets and shoulder pads. The helmet remains kind of a brown color. Um, and we they have a green cloak. So, whereas with Lothlorien, it's kind of that golden brown color throughout. Uh, but you have the Sylvan Blades, as we covered before. You have the Sylvan Axes, Sylvan Spears, and the Sylvan Mounted Company. All the same as uh, with Lothlorien. There's literally no difference. Just the, just the color scheme. The one thing that is different, though, is um, that Lothlorien had the Sylvan Archers. Aaron Gallen, being the more skirmish-focused uh, faction, have Sylvan Slingers. And they use a sling. Um, oh, whoop, I didn't mean to do that. They use a sling. Uh, and it is armor piercing with a missile attack of eight. Uh, but it has a much shorter range than a bow. It's almost like more like a javelin um, than a uh, than a than an arrow. Um, so short range skirmishers. Um, and these are some of the best skirmishers out or sorry, the best slingers in the game. The missile attack at eight. That's very high for a, for a slinger unit. Uh, when they're done with their ammo, they get a ungodly amount of ammo, too. Um, when they're done with their ammo, they then pull out a mace and shield um, for melee, and where they have a melee attack at 14. So they are armor-piercing, a defensive skill of 18, and a shield of 8. They are actually... Probably under costed, they probably should be closer to a thousand than eight fifty. Um, but I think you are restricted in how many you can get. I think you can only get two or three of these. Um, so keep that in mind. They're very. Um, they are prone to being hit with cavalry, though. I was, yeah. So that yeah, if they get hit with um, cavalry, that's kind of their plans uh, for the day kind of ruined. So do keep that in mind. Um, they can hide anywhere. It's really all there is to save up the Sylvan Slingers. And then oh, we'll fix that Silver Surfer, by the way. I don't know why he's surfing like that. Or why he's so shiny. I guess I forgot to assign the texture to him, that officer. But that'll be fixed. Um, it's pretty easy to do. But then we move to the mid-tier, and these units are the half Sindar that I spoke of before. Um, they all have Sindar names, and um, they're kind of comparable to the Galathrim that we saw in Mont Lorient's roster. Uh, they all have the Sindar nomenclature, Mythor, the something. And so, in this case, with the archers, the Mythor archers, we have the Mythor Equilib, which, which translates to something like Warriors of the Arrow. Um, and they are a Sylvan, a half Sylvan unit of archers, so they do use uh, poison arrows, I believe. Um, the missile attack of seven, they have a melee attack of eight, and they use a great sword, I believe, in melee. Fairly certain that's what they use. Um, can't see it on their back. Uh, yeah, I'm fairly certain they use a great sword in melee, though. So they are pretty. Um, they are relatively useful in melee. Melee attack of eight is maybe a little lackluster, but they are only 800 florins uh, for the privilege. So armor of seven. That's about on par. I think it's about. On, was it nine? Yeah, um, so they're not quite as heavily armored as the uh, Galathrim were, or the heavy Falathrim in uh, Linden, 
Um, but they are uh, kind of this. This is the sturdiest tier that you've got, though, um, without getting into your bodyguards. Uh, next, you have the Mythoriek, the Warriors of the Spear. This is a dedicated pike unit. Um, and they have comparable stats to their archers. Um, armor of 7, defense of skill of 9. Melee attack of 8, which for a pike is actually pretty good. Um, I suppose it's it's on the higher end of average, I would say. Again, only 800 florins. You can take a good 2 or 3 of these, I believe, um, for the red limit. Pretty solid choice. And then in the case of Rock Lorian, you've got a little bit more in the way of shock infantry. Um, and that's made manifest with the Mythori Hethel. These are the warriors of the blade, I think. The warriors of the axe. Can't remember uh, what that was supposed to translate to. Uh, and they have a shield on their back, which makes them kind of compensates for the fact that you only get you only have one dedicated unit of shock infantry so far. Um, yours are really good because they have a shield. So only armor of seven, um, but they do have a shield of three. Uh, when it, when a shield is on their back like this, it's intended to rep It's intended to be fifty percent of what it would be if they were holding it. So a shield value of six. Actually, that should be a shield value of um, eight or so. So that'll probably go up to four at some point in the future, but. Minor things here. Uh, and attack of 15, charge bonus 15 is actually relatively average. Um, only 950 florins, though, is pretty good. They tend to do very well in games I've played um, with or as them and against them. They'll soundly beat something like the, um, the uh, Heavy Philathra Max Guard, for instance, because of the shield value, it tends to make the difference. Um, so that's your, that's your Mike Thor uh, Ehitho. And then you have the Hemi Dower. These are your Rangers. Um, and they have kind of a lower missile attack. I can't remember what arrow type these guys use, though. I uh, I want to say it's the silver thorn. I could be wrong about that, though. It might only be poisoned. In either case, you know what both of those air types do. Now I've explained it a few times. Really low armor. Um, they're kind of like Sylvan and or Sindar, like half Sindar rangers. So, um, and given that they're rangers, they are going to have low armor, but they have a Pretty good defensive skill, and I think they dual wield little swords when they're in melee, so. Not, and they're not too shabby in melee. With an attack of 10, uh, cost 950, that might be a little on the higher side, so keep that in mind. Maybe don't bring them in a field battle, but in a siege where you get a little bit more money, it might be worthwhile. Um, they're an okay unit. And then we move on to the bodyguards. You have a few of them uh, for Aaron Gallon. In fact, I think you may have one more. You have one more than you did with Rock Lorian. Uh, so you have a. Uh, the, what is it? The Tyrn in Emendir. These are like the watchers or guardians of Emendir, I think is what that's meant to translate to. Um, they're kind of a. They're a really fun unit to use because they. They, they're an axe thrower, but they also dual wield axes in melee, so they're AP all the time. And they hide anywhere. Um, so they're sort of a hybrid, like a ranger axe thrower. They're really fun to use. Anyway, I think you get, actually, I think you may actually get two of these guys before the red limit and standard mode player. You at least used to. I can't remember if we changed that or not, though. Defensive skill of 15 is pretty good. Um, they're meant to be kind of a lower end bodyguard unit, like not amazing. Um, that would be why you could get two of them. Um, anyhow, so their defensive skill is 15, so it's average, but on the 
upper end of average. Um, for a unit that's dual wielding weapons. Armor of four is kind of lackluster. That probably needs to go up to like six at least, given that they're wearing some scale here. Um, <clears throat> no shield or uh, nothing to represent quick reflexes or anything like that. The melee attack 13, a missile attack 12. That's their throwing axe. So they're really deadly uh, if they get their throwing axes off because they are AP throwing axes and AP dual wielding and melee. Um, you just don't want them to get charged by cavalry, um, especially, or shock infantry, because they will go down, <laughs> and they will drop like flies. Uh, but against, you know, dedicated infantry, well, you know, sort of like sword and board infantry, they will blend their way through them. So just watch out for cavalry. Don't let them get shot at too much, and they'll perform very well. One of my favorite units, uh, one of my favorite of any of the Elven units, uh, full stop, are the Earthen and Aranor. These are like the guardians of Aaron Gallon, kind of like the royal guard, so to speak. Um, and they are monsters. They have an attack of 26, charge bonus 15, decent defense, um, pretty good armor, really, for um, Sindar, like Sindar of Aaron Gallon, pretty good armor. Slightly above average defensive skill and a pretty decent cost, I would say. Maybe a little bit on the higher end of things, but not bad, really. Um, they tend to do remarkably well against other shock infantry bodyguards. Um, so, I do suggest you take uh, take one, and if <laughs> if the rules are permitted uh, are permitting, maybe in a siege take two. Because they are, they are really good. Um, this is kind of your your uh, generic general's bodyguard for Eric and Gallon. It's kind of a hybrid um, archer, and, uh, and then they pull out a two-handed axe. Um, <clears throat> so they, they have a melee attack of 16, uh, which is kind of low. Um, but a slightly higher than average defensive skill, kind of on the upper end of average. Armor of 8, again, really good, because they're kind of a ranger unit, really, because they, they hide anywhere. Um, no shield or anything, um, and they cost 1,600. They use the same arrows, I believe, as the core gears of Karis Galifant, so they very good archers, and I believe that makes them armor piercing. Yeah, their, their arrows are, are AP, so. Um, really, really good archers. Really good archers. Um, so that's your, uh, your Tirithar and Aranor. That's another way. I think. This is like the Earthen and Aaron, or like the warriors of Aaron Gallon, or something, and then these are the guard of Aaron Gallon, and something like that. Um, you then have the Donoth and Orifer. These are the um, your cavalry bodyguard. They get a unique mount. The stag here also came from Boatet originally, I believe. Uh, and they're a uh, Jav cavalry unit, a skirmish cav. They are two hit points. Or no, they're not, actually. They're one. I apologize. Um, that's right. We didn't want... Um, so I guess they should probably be more like down here. They're kind of halfway between bodyguard and elite. But uh, it translates to Fist of Horror. Low armor. Um, but really good defensive skill. They're actually really good against other cavalry, uh, and they're also good at um, taking down, like, cycle charging infantry, too. So they're kind of one of those hybrid, like, uh, anti-cav, like, spear cav, and lance cav units. So you should probably take them. Um, the only thing holding them back is that they're only one hit point, and... But in every other respect, they're a true bodyguard. So um, don't let them get shot at, though. That's the one thing you, you want to 
you want to protect them from because they will they will um, they will die off pretty quick if they're shot at by archers and they they'll get outranged by archers because they are javelin throwers so keep that in mind and then you have ants and I apparently forgot to fix the skeleton for the ants because they should be considerably taller than this. These are the Omadrin. Um, they're really just, um, what would you say? They're um, kind of comparable to trolls. They have seven hit points. They're a monster unit, so that's why they have seven hit points. Uh, defensive skill 14 is pretty good for a unit like that. Armor of nine is average, maybe slightly on the lower up side of average, but they have an attack 34 and a charge bonus of 10. They are, um, again, as I say, like trolls. Uh, you get combat bonus in woods, effective against armor. Um, no, that's your, that's your uh, ends. I'll fix that skeleton so they do stand a bit taller at some point here. Uh, I was trying to experiment around with getting them to throw um, uh, rocks used for artillery. Uh, it's kind of mimic what they do in the movies, but um, the skeleton didn't really match it, and I needed. I, I guess I just forgot to change the skeleton in the model back. So, and then finally, you have the you know, Elven faction. You guys all know the drill now. You get a ballista and a cat. And that is the roster and battle map of Aaron Gallant. So I will return to the campaign map where I will discuss Dorwinian. So we'll be back in just a moment. All right, and welcome back to the battle map. Uh, we're back here with Dorwinian. And I know I said earlier that Lothlorien might have been the most complicated of the Elven factions, but actually I need to eat my words here. It, it actually is probably Dorwinian, so you have to bear with me a moment. Um... The issue with Dorwinian is they don't really have a whole lot of canon, uh, like canonical lore behind them, so we had to generate them um, almost entirely from scratch. So I will go ahead and discuss the background and campaign for, for Dorwinian. So the Hidden Kingdom of Dorwinian is one of two factions in Wards of Arda that is an elven-human hybrid faction. To understand the lore basis of Dorwinian Wars of Arda, I need to briefly explain the Avari. So this is kind of Silmarillion lore. Uh, following the war for the sake of the elves, before the First Age, the elves awoke around the shores of the Bay of Guivianen, far in the east of Middle Earth. I always struggle with that name. Uh, the Valar sought to bring them to Valinor, which is on the continent of Amman, west over the sea of Middle Earth. The Vala, Arome, the hunter, was sent into Middle-earth to Guvianen so that he could lead the elves to Aran. And that's... So we're talking... They're, they woke over here, and Arome finds them over here. The elves at that time um, existed in three different clans, none of which I'm going to get into in this video, as it is really complicated, and I can't be bothered to make this video any longer than it is already going to be. Suffice to say, however, that some from the second and third clans refused to follow Orome, and instead remained far in the east of Middle-earth. Uh, these were the more Quendi, the refusers. The most prominent of which are the Avari. Now that's a gross oversimplification, but again, I just don't want to, I just don't have time in this video to cover that. And there are some great videos out there on this topic already. Now eventually Melkor would return, and it is said that he preyed upon the Avari, and took some of them and tormented them with foul magic and turned them into the first orcs. Tolkien had many iterations of this origin story of the orcs, so it's difficult to say which is truly concrete canon and which isn't but this one does seem to be the most likely. When the second born of the children of the Luvatar awoke, they likewise awoke far in the east of Middle-earth, but in a slightly different location. Um, let's see. What is important to know about that uh, is that like the elves, many of them would travel west, though some refused. 
men first encountered the Avari, and um, and they taught them what they knew of many things, including the forging of metals. Though the Avari themselves were inferior in this regard when compared to other elves, and especially when compared to the dwarves. The final official canon point that we use in the basis for Dorwini and his affection is that we know that the elves of Aaron Gallen, so here, and the men of Eskaroth, right there, um, imported their fine wines. From this point forward, we only discuss lore that we created as extra canonical for the purposes of Dorwinian and Wars of Arden. So the hidden kingdom of Dorwinian is a realm that much like Doriath is hidden by a magical girl, as well as natural terrain and mysticism. It is a hidden kingdom that, like Gondolin, does not permit those who find it to leave except by explicit permission of the king or the unanimous decision of the Avari Council. The capital city's name and location has yet to be determined, uh, and we don't, as of yet, have named characters established for Dorwinian, as that will come later when we begin campaign building. What I can say is that there is an Avarian king, and his rule is hereditary, but his authority has to have the consent of the Avari Council, otherwise it simply will not be enforced. Dorwinian is a realm that has persisted since the First Age, and has endured despite the changing tides of war, famine, and plague. Only during the War of the Last Alliance did they get involved, and only begrudgingly so, when they joined in on the side of the Allies. It was in part due to their actions that the men of the East were held in check, which may have tipped the balance of the war against Sauron. But this intervention in an outside war was costly, which only reinforced their desire to remain in isolation. The cost of war and isolation, however, meant that their population dwindled and may have collapsed. And so it was decided that select groups of humans, Northmen, Eastrons, and otherwise, would be allowed to settle in the fertile lands of Dorvanian. Now there were good Easterlings, in particular during the First Age. These men were led by Bor the Faithful, who died in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. We'll talk more about these men when we get to a future faction overview of the Eastern Human Factions, and in a future developer diary when we talk about the Eastern Human Factions. Suffice to say that we have taken the liberty of assuming that most of the good Easterlings would be descended from the House of Bor. Many of these would be given refuge in Borwinian, which in part explains their presence in the roster. The Eastrons of Dorwinian live predominantly in and around one city that resides along the west coast of the Sea of Rune, and that will likely be, um, may end up being renamed, but that will likely be this Strombost here. That's where they will reside primarily. Now I will explain the human contingent of Dorwinian in general. These men, that over the millennia have been allowed to settle and live in Dorwinian, have lived with minimal contact with the Avari. Despite this, they are still referred to as the Elvelin, or the Elf Friends, which is Quenin, and are analogous to the Adain, which is also Elf Friends, but in Sindarin. They swear allegiance both to the King and the Council, and have amongst themselves no real central leader. They instead select, when the occasion arises, from amongst their nobility, a consul uh, to lead them in war and to speak for them before the Avari. Now the nobility is partly determined by the amount of land one owns. The Alvelin are exclusively, or almost exclusively, Northmen, who live among themselves on estates as serfs, as statesmen, who are men who own minor amounts of land and title, and masters of the state, who own major plots of land, title, and wealth, and are prone to um, wanting the luxuries of plate armor and other fine things from other lands. It is from the latter category that the Olvelin Consul is selected. Finally, there is the generational issue to discuss 
that divides both aspects, Elvellum and, El and Avari, uh, within Dorwinian. The Elvellum elder masters of the state, much like the Avari council and the Avarian king, have no interest in changing the status quo within Dorwinian, as it works well enough for everyone involved. It is the ambitious youth in both camps that seek to either return to the old ways of the Avari, which would essentially sideline the old villain, or, in the case of the old villain, an attitude that is best described as out with the old and in with the new, where the old villain the statesmen take over and sideline the Avari. To this point, the status quo has prevailed, but in a future Darwinian campaign, it will be up to the player to decide if this will continue. I imagine that a future script um, would consist of something like the council will be split over whether or not to impose an Elvellan tax to support the Avari, and you, as the king of Darwinian, will be the tie-breaking vote. If you were to agree, your ability to trade with the other factions and your economy in general would be somewhat restricted, but your rate of Avari unit recruiting would be accelerated. If you were to reject the tax, you would then be asked about whether or not you want to force the old Ellen to pick a new consul, as they had just picked a younger and more ambitious sort. The consequences of such a decision have yet to be worked out, but would impact your gameplay in some tangible fashion. In other words, you will need to manage a deeply divided realm, and will need to pick your allies with care, and your enemies even more uh, carefully so. And that is that for the background and war and uh, campaign uh, for Dorwinian. We'll now turn to the battle map. Okay, welcome back to the battle map, this time with Dorwinian. <clears throat> so now Dorwinian uh, was a faction more or less designed by a co-developer named Carmondi. He, um, as I say, he more or less designed this faction and he did a really good job with it. Um, Given that it, it's such a complicated faction, though, we're still working out some of the kinks with it, and we've got some new, like, exclusive assets to the models that are um, that are you're only going to find in Wars of Arda at this point. So, a lot of it, it is a lot of these things are borrowed, uh, but you'll see the occasional weapon throughout the roster that will be exclusive to us. So, and some of those things we're still trying to fix, um, we're still trying to get just right. So. Some of this faction is still kind of a work in progress, though it is like 99% done. So, anyhow, without further ado, uh, we'll start with the Eastron. Uh, so, the, these are the Eastron Hunters. They use a um, sling, I believe. Yeah, they use a sling and they use. They use a sling that it has a missile attack of 5, and they use, I think it's a maze. Or an axe. I'm going to say it's one of those two. Um, it gives them a melee attack of seven. Uh, their defense overall is actually pretty good. They're, I put them in this right here, not to necessarily reflect that they're militia tier, because they are not. They're very good. Um, they're more like a middle tier, but I, I just meant to segregate out the E-strong units from the rest of the roster. So don't think of them as militia, because they are most certainly not. These are the Eastron Hunters. Uh, they're meant to be the Easterlings that um, inhabit the countryside of Eastern Dorwinian. And these are the Eastron Merchant Riders. Uh, they are a hybrid, like, lance and uh, archer cavalry. Um, they're not especially good. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, I take that back. They're more of a... Um, spear cap, so they're better at taking down another cavalry. Um, but I don't think they're, they'll function well enough as a lancer unit. Um, just don't expect too terribly much out of them. They are more kind of a uh, militia tier unit, but only 550 florins. And their stats would suggest that as well. Uh, defensive skill of 8 with the spear is actually pretty good though. So, And a missile attack of 7 is also really good. So, And you can, you, you can get a good two or three of them, I believe, uh, before the red limit. So definitely for a field battle, I suggest getting these. Um, for siege, 
they're probably not quite as worth it. Um, other than maybe keeping your energy busy, but yeah, I don't think they do a good enough job with that to suggest for a siege. Um, so those are the two units that make up the eastern, like the easterling uh, segment of your roster. And then we'll kind of bounce back and forth between the Elvellum and the Avari as we progress up the ladder here. So next we have the Elvellum Serfs, and they have like farmhand tools and whatnot and shields. They do wield these uh, like scythes and whatnot two-handed, uh, and they have, they're not armor piercing, but they are body piercing, and they can hit more than one unit model. Um, so that's kind of their their kick. Otherwise, they are absolute garbage militia. Um, they should be thought of as such. They actually have a pretty decent attack, though. Um, and they do have a bonus against cavalry. Uh, and But their defensive stats make them horrible for taking... Um, they can take a little bit of arrow fire, given that they've kind of got a bit of armor and a bit of a shield, but it won't save them, especially if they're if you're shooting at an arc that takes their shield out of the equation. You're only <laughs> you only have an armor of four uh, to protect you at that point. And honestly, that's probably a little bit too generous of an armor value for them. Probably should be more like two. Um, so unless if you just want to use them as a meat shield, which is valid. Um, I would suggest maybe, um, you know, take them to fill out your roster if need be. Um, but um, yeah, I guess they, they do have their place. They're kind of, they're better than Orc Fodder, uh, but not much better. So let's keep that in mind. You'll get a lot of them, a lot of them, and they're cheap. So uh, quantity, I guess, has a quality of its own, so... Uh, next, you have the Elvellum Militia, which have um, which are javelin throwers. Uh, again, the, it's all in the name. They are militia, so they're not gonna they're not gonna um, they won't necessarily be the deciding force. Uh, but for militia, they are really good. Uh, they have a missile attack of four and a melee attack of five, which actually is really high for a militia tier unit. Um, their defense is abysmal, though. It's actually lower than the serfs, which needs correcting. Um, oh, and it's because I forgot to add their shield value in. That would be why. Um, that's a typo. So it should probably be 15 um, rather than 10. Um, and that will be corrected. That takes five seconds to do. Um, <clears throat> I believe they use an axe in melee so they do they are ap all the time um and for that privilege uh you have to pay a little bit more you have to pay 500 florins rather than the pathetic paltry 350 for the serves um so you know these i would say elf and militia are probably more worthwhile an investment than the serfs are but um that that's certainly just my thoughts on the matter he's really kind of they're a little bit more than farmhands, um, but they don't really own the land. Uh, they probably just rent it, um, whereas these are basically just slaves. So, uh, so that's the militia tier of Elvelin, and there's not really an Avari militia tier. So we'll go on ahead to the mid tier, and really, these three units, the Elvellan House Carls, Retainers, and Statesmen, probably should be up here. Um, but again, I was just trying to segregate the Avari from the Elvellan. So just recognize that these two, three, like eight or nine units here in the middle are actually probably equivalent. Okay, so we have the Elvellan House Carls. They are excellent. Um, Axe-wielding shock infantry. Excellent. Um, they've always done really well in games. I've only ever played against this iteration of Dwarf Winning, and they've always done really well. Um, and you have to pay money for it. I mean, they cost 950 florins, but they are well worth every cent. An attack of 17 for a mid-tier unit is fantastic. 
Charge bonus of 15 is pretty average. Armor of 10, though, for a unit of Northmen is really good. With a defensive skill of 14, well worth every cent of this 950. Take as many of these as you can for multiplayer games. And in the campaign, they'll be real, they'll be really useful for you there, too. Uh, next, you have the Othell and Retainers. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper. Um, let's see. They're 17, right? Okay. So, yeah, they're a little bit cheaper. Um, but they are phenomenal pikemen uh, for a mid tier human unit of pikes. Uh, an attack of 9 is really good for a pike unit. Um, with a defensive skill of 17, that is out of this world for a unit of pikes. That probably actually is a typo. <laughs> it's so good. It probably should be like 10 max. Um, but honestly, I'm happy to leave that as long as they were restricted to just one or two before the red limit. Um, so that available, all the things might change a little bit. 900 forms, again, well worth every cent. Uh, next, we have the Eldel and a Statesman. This is your... I think that's your only dedicated sword and board unit. And they are probably grossly underpriced. Um, the only thing that lets them down is their kind of mediocre defensive stats. But an attack of 12 is borderline bodyguard tier for a sword and board unit. Um, and I love this model, too, by the way. Um, the, uh, the shields are meant to, the, so the golden shields are meant to convey kind of an Eastern influence. Um, and then the purple, of course, is just stock Northman of Berlinian. Um, you can take a good number, I think you can take four or five of these before the red limit. So you just have a single unit of sword and board that are solidly good right at the core of your army. I honestly think the Elvellan Statesmen are kind of the backbone of Gorwinian. Them and the Elvellan Militia. If you're going with a more Elvellan centered build, definitely want the Elvellan Statesmen. Take as many as you can. If, on the other hand, you want a more of an Avari centered build, uh, there's few better places to begin than with the Avari Peacekeepers. Now the Avari are phenomenal. Um, but there are fewer Avari with each passing generation, so we reflected this with a smaller unit size. Not quite bodyguard size, but um, less than the elite of the old uh, And So you have to pay, so it works out to about balance when you uh, factor in the cost with their unit size. Uh, they have a missile attack 8. Again, these are on the same level as the Sylvan Slingers, but probably a bit worse. They do have that sort of Sylvan Elven, you know, they're a Bari, uh, shield thing going for them, where they get a shield value of one to reflect their skill, like their reflexes and whatnot. Um, I forgot that these actually, I think, have an armor upgrade. Um, some of the Avari units do. Uh, a uh, defensive skill of 22 is fantastic, especially because they, I believe these use, uh, I can't remember if they use a great sword or if they dual wield swords. I want to say they dual wield swords, uh, so, but they're not armor piercing and melee, only with their slings. Um, again, a sling attack of 8 is fantastic, so... Um, I would say they're well worth the cost. You get two or three of them for the red limit. If you want an, an Avari build, you got to take them. Avari pikes, likewise, are really good. Uh, the attack is lower than I was expecting. That, that should be more like 10. Again, I have to apologize for a lot of the typos in here. Uh, yep. Door winning, especially, is, a, is definitely a work in progress. But um, they're kind of lackluster at 600. Okay, so the retainers are probably going to end up being the better pikes just because of their armor on balance. But if you want a skilled unit of pikes, it'll probably end up being 
I think that's that may have been what happened is I intended to give the um, I'm sorry the skill of 17 to the Avari Pikes and accidentally gave it to the Elvellan Pikes. Um, but yeah, there'll be a really skilled unit of pikemen. This is an exclusive pike that we put together. I'm really proud of it. Um, there's a really good unit of pikes. Definitely want to take them. I think you can only get one or two for the red limit, though, so keep that in mind. Uh, next, you have the Avari Rangers. Uh, these guys use poison arrows, kind of like you can kind of think of the Avaris being related to the Sylvan Elves. Uh, they use this great sword in uh, melee. It's actually more of a glaive, and so it, I think it actually has some of the same stats to it that the Serfs had before, where it's like can hit more than one model. Um, really good in melee too. Let me find their. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so they have um, melee thirteen. Yeah. Um, their melee tech was probably dropped because of the, the other attributes they have that contribute to their melee prowess. Defensive skill 15 is pretty average for a Swordmaster um, style unit. This attack of 8, that is poison, uh, makes them, for some reason these guys, I don't understand it, especially given their unit size, they tend to just break my units all the time. Um, really good unit of rangers. And decent armor. Six um, makes them actually pretty good at skirmishing as well. I don't know if they can hide anywhere though. No, that'll probably be added. They'll probably be able to hide anywhere it's, um, in a future iteration. We get around to fixing them. Um, so that's your Avari Rangers. Uh, and then these are kind of the. Um, so you have these statesmen before that I described in the campaign as being the ambitious youth of the Elvellan. That's what these guys are, the Avari Guardians, along with uh, the Peacekeepers, um, as being the ambitious youth of the Avari. They are Javelin Throwers, and then I believe Spearmen. Uh, let me find them here. They are... You know, it is these. Okay, the Avari Guardians. So yeah, they have a melee attack of 10, the Spear, which is really good. Uh, they have a Javelin of 10, which is amazing. Um, that's AP. Pretty average armor. Um, defensive for Avari, anyway. Defensive skill of 20 makes them phenomenal spearmen. And I'm, I'm almost positive they're spearmen in melee. Um, and I think they also get an armor upgrade as well. 800 florins worth every penny. Uh, you got to take all these if you're doing an Avari Center build. The Rangers, I would say if you're doing an Avari Center build, the ones you want to take. Not necessarily the Rangers, although they can be useful. Guardians and um, Peacekeepers. The Pikes are the Pikes when they're fixed, maybe as well. But um, the Guardians and Peacekeepers are the ones you want. Uh, and then. The, yeah, it should be your uh, mid tier, both Velen and Avari done. Finally, you have the bodyguards, and we're going to start with the old Velen. The old Velen Estate Masters. Now, these guys, this is a model that's held over from the Forge that we're going to keep. They are, um, they're me these are the like the guards of the console, the old Velen console, and they like to import armor and um, or have armor fashioned for them by artisans from Gondor. So that's kind of where you see the Numenorean influence in their armor. Um, phenomenal. Uh, well, they use these little hammers, and they've got a shield. So they've got an armor set of 12, which is about as it's close, it's close to um, the highest that it gets for a unit of Northmen, so... Pretty good. Defensive skill of 12 is slightly lacking, but with a shield of 10, it more than makes up for it. Two hit points, of course. Attack of 16. Um, about average. It's really their defensive stats that put them at, uh, at where the, kind of the thing that they hang their hat on. Really, for what they are, they're actually kind of only average, but you don't really get anything else like this. 
so much for um, for Darwinian. So given that, um, you know, they um, that kind of puts them at their cost of thirteen hundred. So, so that's the old villain of state masters. Um, maybe the best shock infantry unit in the game. Well, not, okay, not quite that high, but they are very, very good. Or the Avarni Council. Um, they have eight these AP glaives that give them a bonus against cavalry. They've been attack at twenty, charge at fifteen, defensive thirty-three. Very powerful. They're arguably undercosted. That that probably needs to go up to like fifteen hundred. Um, the shield that they get on their backs gives them the shield bonus. Really potent unit. And these are the absolute uh, pinnacle of the Avari. If you're going with an Avari center, even if you're not going, even if you're going with an Ovalon center build, you might still consider getting the Avari Council. Um, and they'll be your, like, your kind of like generic general's bodyguard for your Avari. The estate masters will be for the Ovalon. And then we have a mounted version. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, these would be Avari riders. Um, Yes. This is not the unit I was expecting. <laughs> this I forgot to mention this unit. They should be down here. Um, they are a unit of spear cad for the Avari. Uh, I think they pull out a sword and melee, so they can actually look after themselves a little bit better. Um, yeah, I, I apologize, guys. That They were meant to be down here. I mistook them for something else. Uh, we used to have it, a mounted unit of council, and that, that's what I uh, mistook them to be. But they're not. They're kind of a anti-cav cavalry unit of, uh, of ours, so that's what those are. And then finally, you have the Gwend and Onodrim. Now these are, um, I should have mentioned this in the background of we're winning a bit, but, but these are these are the Ent Daughters is kind of what that translates to. Some Darin. They are um, so you have the Ent wives that left the Ents, and we think they moved far to the east in the old Ent gardens there that that used to uh, occupy the plain of Daggerlad. Well, uh, when that was burned and destroyed, this is the newest and final generation of Ent wives that there will ever be. And that's kind of why they're they're stunted relative to the the old ent wives. Uh, and as I say, they are infertile, so they will never produce a new generation of ants. So they're that's kind of the basis for them. They're the Gwend and Onodrim, the ant daughters. But they are really good in melee, though. Um, attack of sixteen. It's armor piercing. The charge bonus twenty five. Um, Good skill, good armor, three hit points, unlike the Huorns that we saw um, with Lothlorien. Really good. So I do recommend you take these. Um, and that, other than the Tillery for Dorwinian, now Dorwinian being kind of a half-human, half-elven faction, you have the Ballista for Dorwinian, is crewed by Elves, and the Catapult is crewed by Northmen. So that's uh, that's Dorwinian for you. And we will return to the battle map with one last set of, uh, of faction. That will be the Principality of Belfalas. We'll talk about the, the few elves that are in their roster and in their faction. So we'll be right back with the campaign map. And welcome back to the campaign map for the final time here. Um, we will be talking about the Principality of Belfalas, specifically the Philathrum and, uh, and other Sylvan Elves of Belfalas. Uh, so, finally we come to the Principality of Belfalas, which won't get much time in this developer diary, as they are predominantly a human Dunedain faction. But they do have a small contingent of Philathrum and an even smaller contingent of Sylvan Elves within their society and roster. Now, it was the case that some of the Philathrum in the First Age established colonies in Etheland, and, presum and presumably on Gobel Tolfalas, which is this small island here, 
um, just beyond the mouths of the Anduin River. So this here. Though it is also mentioned that a number of Sylvan Elves came to Ethelin to live in, or as a means of passing into the West. Ethelund is therefore analogous to Mithlond in that way. Um, and what I mean by that is it holds a port um, so that you don't, so that elves in the south of Middle Earth, or further south from Middle Earth, don't have to go all the way to Mithlond to travel to the west. These elves have mostly passed on into the west at this point, but those that remain mostly exist as the Parathil, the half elves. We use the term Parathil really to refer to anyone who is of elven heritage or those from Ethelin, regardless of whether or not they are literally half elven. The amount of plate armor on most of the Parathil units shows the degree to which the Numenorians had an impact on their culture, their way of life, and their way of waging war. The extent of the Sylvan influence is seen in one ranger style Parathil unit, which will be shown momentarily. We will discuss the campaign the Principality of Belfalas and a future developer diary, as the Parathil are only a small part of their roster. We now turn to the battle map for the, for the final time, where I will show the Parathil units of the Principality of Belfalas. Welcome back to the battle map for uh, the final time here. This is for the Parathil of Belfalas. Uh, we have four units in Belfast's roster that are uh, Parathil, and I described what that meant earlier. Um, and so this should be pretty brief. So we have Parathil champions, kind of the pinnacle of them. They use the Falathrum fire arrows that the Falathrum of um, Linden use, that we uh, described earlier. Um, with a missile attack of seven, Pretty good range on them, and a decent ammo supply. Paired with their armor of 11, more of the Numenorean style armor there, all the plate. Uh, defensive skill of 13 in melee, um, which makes them reasonably good. It's, that's actually slightly underwhelming, but given their hybrid nature, it needed to be for balance purposes. Um, and you top that all off with the melee attack it's pretty average of seven or of a 15 their charge of 15. i think it makes for a really well-rounded unit um there is a flaming version of philathrum arrows that um, does not actually take a accuracy penalty when they switch to that so that very worthwhile unit of archers i think they're well worth their cost of a thousand florins and i want to say they may actually be locked morale so um you only get one before the red limit, so keep that in mind. Um, but I do recommend that um, the Belfast players take these guys, especially in a siege. They're very useful there. Maybe not so much in a field battle, but definitely take them in a siege. Uh, and in campaign, um, all of these units will be AOR restricted to Ethelon. Next, you have the Parathel Foresters. Um, you actually have two units of rangers as Belfalas. You have the human version and then the more elite Parathel. And this is the Parathel and the Parathel Foresters. They can hide anywhere. They have a missile attack of six, slightly less than the champions, and it is poison because they're meant to be more sylvan. They're kind of like half, part sylvan, part Falathrum Sendar, part Numenorean. So uh, they've got a little bit of armor, armor of six. A uh, ranged att uh, poisoned missile attack of six, um, melee attack of ten, um, which is pretty average for kind of less than average actually for a sword master. But they pull out this two handed sword, no shield or anything like that. Uh, they cost 700 florins, and I think you get two of them before the red limit. I think they're well worth their cost. Um, they do a lot of they're not especially damaging, but they're just really solid, dependable units, and they can do a, they have a slow drip feed of morale damage. It's really useful. So I definitely recommend people who, who like to have a parathel centered build to bring some of the foresters. Now, now more of your mainline parathel units you have two of. 
Uh, you have Parafil Company, which you get, which come in a rather large unit size of 165, an attack of 10, and the total defense of 24. Very good unit of men at arms, um, an aggressive one with an attack of 10, and at a cost of 850, you're not going to get a whole lot better um, for their tiers. So, I really, when I t play as Belfalox, I take as many of these as I can. And I think you get four or five before the red limit. So do bring in as many of these as you can manage. And then finally, you have the Parathol Mounted Company. And they're just a mounted version of the uh, Parathol Company. Um, 24, 10, 10, 28. So they have a... a hold on. Let's open it up then. Oh, they have a higher they have a higher defensive skill, so that'll probably change for the the normal Parafil company. That'll probably go up. Um, and the Parafil mounted company actually only costs five hundred florins. That's kind of the type of that needs to go up. Um, you can get a good number of them before the round limit. I think it's comparable to the normal company, where it's like four or five. And they are um, melee cavalry. So send them in to fight other cavalry or to temporarily hold the line and get them out. Being melee cavalry, it's not it does not have any real barding. They're uh, pretty quick, uh, very swift unit of cavalry. So you've got that going for you, but you're not going to be slaying knights left and right, though, so keep that in mind. And that is the Parathol of Belfalas and the end of our second developer diary. So, uh, I just wanted to make a brief epilogue of sorts. So that concludes the second official Wars of Art of Developer Diary. Thank you for bearing with me. I know this is a long video, but I wanted to get everything major from version 1.1, the song of the first form in this video. In the future, the open factions mentioned here will have their changes discussed in discrete faction overviews, uh, as well as developer diaries when it pertains to changes to the elves and the impact those changes have had on the campaign. Those will be separated uh, and discussed in the developer diary. Developer diaries will have uh, general roster changes, or general like stat changes to the roster discussed. Uh, we will repeat this process for each of the races represented in this mod, though I expect the, gift, the, the developer diary covering version 1.2, The Gifted of Illumitar, which will cover all human factions, will be split into two videos. Know also that work has already begun on version 1.2, and we will have previews of Alosoth, of Arthodyne, and of Cardolan already being produced at the time of producing this video, circa December of 2021. Anyhow, I thank you for joining us today, and I hope you will join us again in future for another adventure. I've been Bilbo, the host of this video, and I'll be developer for Wars of Thank you so much.